Okay, so recording has started. So thank you everybody for joining us today on a new session for the Data and AI Architecture Group. I am honored to host today this quantum computing primer from my good friend Santiago Nunez Corrales. Santiago is quantum lead and research scientist in the National Center for Supercomputing Applications out of uh, the University of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champlain. And, uh, you know, this is a hot topic. Uh, IT obviously jumps from hot topic for the hot topic, but quantum computing does have, you know, I'm sure like uh, Santiago will, will cover, it does have some amazing applications if we're able to crack this nut. And every now and then, of course, everybody will talk about quantum supremacy and who's doing more in the industry as well. So great. Uh, topic, something that is good for everybody to know a little bit of, you know, keep ourselves educated. I appreciate you taking time of the day as well to join us. I will be posting the recording in the YouTube for the channel after we're done today. And also keep in mind upcoming sessions we got in a couple of weeks, uh, September 21st, we got a data warehouse overview in Microsoft Fabric as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass on the torch. I'm gonna mute myself to Santiago. If you have any questions, put them in the chat and we will make sure we cover them um, at the end. So the floor is all yours, Santiago. Again, thank you very much for doing this for the group today. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to talk since many years that we've seen each other and everybody here. Thank you for being being with us. The first time I actually heard about quantum was through Warner's father, who lent me a book about quantum computing, and that started the ball rolling many years ago. So right now I work for the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and I also am part of the what we call the Illinois Quantum Science and Technology Center. And just to talk about the organization a little bit, it won't take long, but at NCSA is, a, is historically the first NSF funded supercomputing center, and it has gone from the first web browser, the first publicly funded supercomputing for supercomputer for science, using play uh, playstations in 1999 for. So they they bought a, a bunch of them and then put them together, and that was the one of the first scientific uses of graphical processing units. So we've been asking ourselves, what's, what's the next thing that we should invest as an organization looking forward? And of course, quantum pops up right into, into our list. So we have a, a the, our mission is first to accelerate problem solving. We want to materialize something called quantum advantage, and we'll talk about what it means. And the idea is to do that by solving scientific applications and then doing translation between the quantum technologies to the actual people doing the science. This is our mission. We are the A in NCSA is about applications. The second part is we want to also create our own secret sauce, meaning that there's research integrating theoretical and pragmatic aspects of the interaction between physics and computing. And this, this is something quite interesting. One doesn't think about a computing device as a physical device, but it makes it makes sense. Even the computers we have today. In the short term, what we are trying to do is connect quantum devices to supercomputers. This is a non-trivial task and goes well beyond the traditional data center duties. And this is something we nobody has figured out and we are trying to see if we at least can draw the boundaries of what's happening. And at the end of the day, we are trying to also help the university maintain leadership in the area. Essentially, there's a few things that we do. I won't go into much detail, but we are experts in simulation and cyber infrastructure. Cyber infrastructure is the technical term for data science simulation and integrated data centers, for example, and supercomputers. And then we also do software development and research consulting, meaning that people come to us to solve problems. And sometimes we also work in advanced visualization. There's many, even Oscar nominations from that have been awarded to our center for work in, in visualization. So we're trying to take all this expertise and trying to get first contributions that help get better devices and more quantum devices, then to do a bit of the intellectual work of how do we make quantum programming easier? And we're going to see that it is, it is not exactly easy at this point, and that has to change. And finally, helping train the scientific community. That seems to be a priority given what we have right now. We have a few connections with, with us, with the public and private sector companies are extremely important in the work that we do day to day since they are they not only provide the technical context or the access to the devices but we are 
we are true partners and collaborators in the signs that need to be solved. And just to speak briefly about three of the projects, and then it'll make much more sense when I go when I drill down into the quantum computing aspects themselves. The first one is, as I said, we're trying to integrate a quantum system, <coughs> a quantum processing unit. Note the similarity to graphical processing unit, the GPUs. Now we have QPUs with a GPU system. It turns out that to control a quantum computer to make it useful to do computation, you need a lot of variables and there's a lot of classical computation going on. So the first, right off the bat, we make a distinction between classical computers, the computers we know and use every day, and quantum systems, systems that are that follow the laws of quantum mechanics. And part of the work that we will be performing starting next year is the proof of integration, how to connect these two things together, then performing benchmarking. We don't really know how to benchmark these systems in a comprehensive way, so we need to develop those benchmarks from start. And then application testing. We have a few ideas of the kinds of applications that would be possible in a demonstration phase. Also, uh, one of the projects I, that I have personally with IBM is building a digital twin and adding a bit of machine learning strategically to either advance the science itself or help calibrate these devices. And they'll also, I'll explain a bit what goes into those. Finally, I'm also working on a quantum program, quantum high level programming language, again, to get away from circuits. The way we program these devices is similar to writing circuits as it, one would do in computer organization or computer architecture. <clears throat> and circuits are terrible for human communication. So something that we are trying to do is get away as fast as we can from that and develop a full stack in the, in the, in the sense that every level in the stack defines a given programming language of higher sophistication and higher abstraction. So <clears throat> what I want to do today after this brief introduction is to go into the funding and technology landscape, how the, how the market looks like, what is happening at the, at the public sec in the public sector and what the technologies are, and then go into why it is interesting. And finally, drill down a little bit into the principles. I will try to avoid as much mathematics as possible. And this is one of the goals. There's there's a saying in one of the famous uh, books in science, popularization of science, that every question you put in a book has the readership. So I'm going to try and be as succinct as possible. So first, quantum computing seems to be en route to be a transformational technology. This is a <clears throat> four, foresight study by Atos in 2016 in France. And what do we mean by transformational as a technology? It means that it has a broad range of applicability and potential impact. It can shorten time to single solution. We know that there are computational problems that are extremely expensive to solve because no algorithm can be found faster than a certain benchmark. Also, feasible problem size, we may have a limited amount of, we, we may not have the best possible algorithm because it may not exist, but maybe we can accelerate it to a point or we can accelerate computation to a point that makes feasible larger problem instances in practice. Or we could even come up with new kinds of problems we can solve with quantum devices. So it differentiates from quantum differentiates from classical across all these dimensions. So especially in the market, the leading areas are North America, Europe is emerging in the last couple of years also as a hot market and also Asia and Pacific. And depending on the estimates, the compound annual growth rate oscillates between 33.1% and another estimated 43%, which is, regardless of how you see it, it is a very, it is a fastly, a fast moving market. And there's a significant amount of investment in the world. By 2022, <clears throat> uh, it was estimated to be around $35 billion worldwide. So locations of research investment, again, this, cor this correlates with US, Canada, Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And these are major centers that are in, that are spending money either through industry or academia to develop a multitude of technologies. And then there's there's a whole host of fields from quantum sensing to quantum information theory that if any of you have interest, we can discuss a bit at the end. There was a wonderful document that any of you who are interested and also involved with company strategy 
would be very useful to read. And it, it was the state of quantum computing, building a quantum economy released in September 2022 by the World Economic Forum, where that estimate was brought about a $35.5 billion in investment across multiple continents, multiple activities in quantum computing. With respect to the US government, in 2017, um, the Congress approved the quantum, the National Quantum Initiative, which sets up investment boundaries that include public, private, and government sectors or academic sectors. And there's a multitude of organizations in the US government that already have invested a substantial amount of money. And in particular, we see that there's a, a crossover between national security and civilian applications as well. In terms of funding <clears throat> for, from the United States government, it has increasingly, it has increased steadily since 2019. And now the bit that is tapering up or that is starting to become a bit more regular or going into steady state rather can be explained by industry involvement. There's a, a larger role for industry that is being carved out as we speak. In terms of things that the federal government is going to fund through the Department of Energy, for example, we go from algorithms, finding new ways of using these systems, building the computer science around it, creating networks, standing up testbeds. A testbed basically is a computer that people can use to experiment with it and try to figure out some of the unknown unknowns that we still have in the field. And then if you find there's bioimaging, there's things in the med medical space, there's also applications in fusion plasma modeling and also things that are more, more in the fundamental science of, of physics. There's also a huge evolving market and it goes from people making up the components to build the quantum computers, people who are assembling these systems and they are proper hardware vendors, there are software offerings, meaning companies that will build the software that sits on top of these, of, of these platforms. There's applications of companies who specialize in getting to the market, going to find problems and trying to find solutions that can be solved at higher speed or with fewer resources using quantum computers. And then finally, users, people like Boeing, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, who are companies that are looking forward to using these devices to solve some of the hardest problems in engineering, science, and, and other fields. As an example, Boeing recently, alongside JP Morgan and Quantinum, developed a simulation or developed a code that could speed up, theoretically, if we had these machines of the right size, that could speed up fluid dynamics, which is very strongly used for airplane design. So in terms of quantum hardware, what do we find? We have two kinds of technologies. One of them is called annealing, and there's a, a company name, D-Wave, that has been floating around since 2006. It's one of the first, it is the first quantum computing company, and it uses a principle that does not rely on having bits of quantum nature. So we have, for classical computing, we have bits. For quantum computing, we have quantum bits. And D-Wave doesn't have any of those. What we call universal gate-based quantum systems <clears throat> are systems that extend the notion of a bit to the quantum realm and then try to apply different physical principles to make sure we have stable quantum systems that we can do computation with. And that is the important point. So we have something, the dominant ones, for example, from IBM and Google are superconducting. The other ones are trapped ions. Topological quantum bits are from Microsoft. I won't go into those today. And the photonic ones, I also won't touch, but those are technologies that have very high potential for miniaturization. If I were to state, compare, compared to the classical computing landscape, where we sit in terms of the history of, of our field, I would say that quantum computing resembles classical computing in 1950. And there is a bit, this is a bit of a sobering realization, but it also allows us to place expectations correctly. These systems are unreliable. A lot of things are still experimental. You need to plug things in directly. I've done that myself in the lab many times with my physicist colleagues who are patient enough to teach me what I really don't know sometimes in terms of, of, of the equipment or the physics. And then it is, again, it is more of an experiment of how to do computation <clears throat> than a system. 
it has started moving into the direction of having computational systems as the collection of software, hardware, and practices that allow us to be productive in some way. So what does a superconducting machine look like? At the right in the screen, you would see the team at the University of Illinois, Brian DeMarco and Wolfgang Pfaff, two of my collaborators. And they have, they have one of these systems, which is basically, this is a huge refrigerator. You have a classical computer, you have a system that sends signals and retrieves signals from this thing, and you have a cooling system, you have a cryogenic system. And the, the computer is simply what's at the bottom of this decrease uh, of this cone of decrease in size. So essentially, this is called a uh, um, dilution refrigerator. So the system to behave in the quant in a quantum manner needs to reach as close to absolute zero as possible. So it starts at room temperature, let's say uh, 74 Fahrenheit, 20, 20 Celsius. Then it goes below 20 into 50 Kelvin degrees. 50 Kelvin degrees is colder than any fridge that we have on Earth for biological samples. It's colder than Antarctica. Then it goes into three Kelvin. This is closer to the app to the temperature, the average temperature in deep space. And then it has to be cooled around tens, ten, tens of milli Kelvin degrees. These are some of the coldest temperatures reached in the universe and especially reached by artificial by artificial means. And then the quantum processor then made of a lot of atoms works in, this, in such a way that it starts behaving like a single atom. And this is something called the bose einstein condensation effect. And this is part of the principle behind superconductivity. So we use the fact that this chunk of matter behaves like an atom to do operations that you could only do on atoms themselves. And then you know, going into the details, this is the first bunch of equations, but I won't go too much into it. This is called a Josephson junction. Usually current in the circuit runs only in one direction, but when you reach those low temperatures, then you're able to have electricity running both ways at the same time. And that is the way one defines probability. People in data science <clears throat> would know that the mathematics of quantum computing are very similar. They're linear algebra. And any system capable of having linear algebra of doing linear algebra with complex numbers is a medium suitable for quantum computing or simulating it or doing it in a, in a real physical system. And then at, at UOUC, there's people who actually manufacture these this circuits. And then there's a bunch of equations that are basically they govern how, how much of a zero is something or how much of a one is something, roughly speaking. And then there's another technology, which is an ion trap in which you have a circuit where you send a stream of atoms. In this case, these are calcium atoms. You can do that with strontium. You can do that with ytterbium, like the Sandia National Labs platform. And then you use something called optical tweezing. An optical tweezing, tweezer is a, a bunch of lasers that allow you to pick an atom in vacuum and place it where you want. This is really cool. And I've seen people do that, and it's flabbergasting to observe. So basically, then when you have these atoms, these are, so if you shine light on, of an, on an atom, it'll change its energy state and release another photon. But in the meantime, you can start probing the structure of the atom by doing that repeatedly. And you can encode something similar to logic gates. And this is how computation is made. So essentially, <clears throat> you have a bunch of atoms, you shine light on it, on, on those atoms, and you basically do computation. There's another kind of platform called neutral atoms in which it works not exactly by having quantum bits, but, but by having individual atoms. And what you do is try to take, for example, a problem in graph theory and make sure that, you, that the proximity of the atoms corresponds to the strength of the weight in the graph. This is done again physically, and it's, it's quite interesting. Now, we are in the age of what John Preskill in 2018 called the noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, meaning these devices are small. We don't really know, we still don't know how to remove the noise. Noise meaning that these devices are probabilistically unreliable and we haven't figured out a way to shield them from the environment well enough to be, uh, to be more reliable. 
And intermediate scale means that we are still within the range of a few tens of quantum bits to a few thousands of quantum bits. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of applications, and those of you who are interested in machine learning, turns out that quantum computing can accelerate machine learning, and it has all the very beautiful properties for the underlying mathematics. Now, this estimate was a bit old, and we are still not there. It was off the mark, but we are moving into the ter territory of what we call fault-tolerant quantum computing. And I'm going to explain a bit why it is why, why this may be relevant to the future. So where are we going? Basically, we are going to a larger number of physical qubits. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with IT and infrastructure provisioning will remember that we have something called error correction codes. And for example, the, in the memories, there, there's ECC memories that we use to avoid recomputation or to to prevent the effects, the, the spread of events, the spread of errors in computation. Turns out that we also have logical qubits, which are qubits you obtain by applying correct error correction codes by having redundancy with multiple quantum bits per logical qubit. This is very expensive, and the scales of integration to get something useful done have been estimated to be around hundreds of thousands of physical qubits to tens of millions of physical qubits to then achieve a few hundreds to a thousand quantum quantum bits that are logical. So we have a hardware design problem that has not been solved, partially because we still don't understand completely what we need from the physics. However, companies like IBM, Quantinum, QERA have consistently met their mark and have been evolving their hardware to the point that they're starting to do really interesting things and solving really interesting problems. In the case of IBM, they've gone from devices in 2019, the largest one, 27 qubits, down to this last year's 433 qubits, and they're expected to release this year one in the 1,000 qubit mark. As in any computer system, any single device will have a limit, a size limit, a form factor limit, because of the natural laws governing the device and the conditions for cooling, stability, shielding. <clears throat> but it seems that it is also evolving at a faster rate than what classical hardware did in the 1950s and 60s. Again, we are I'm comparing to that point in time because this is the sophistication of the technology, essentially. There's another measure that you will find in, in all the buzzwords in this field called quantum volume. So if you want to analyze the performance or the capabilities of a classical computing system, you would look at memory size, clock speed, uh, number of bits in, 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 in the control bus or the data bus. In, in. And at the end of the day, there, there's a limited number of, of metrics that you can say, OK, this machine is going to perform decently within the range of applications that I need. For a quantum system, we are still learning what those metrics are. And the one that has been proposed that is, seems to be the strongest one is quantum volume, meaning the combination of how many quantum bits I can use at any given point in time reliably, multiplied by the length of the circuit, the longest circuit I can run without too much errors, multiplied by the, the kinds and by the diversity of the gates that you find directly in there. So this is something that uh, those of you who may be interested would be worth exploring and understanding a bit more. If you forego the mathematical definitions, which are really not that important, then it boils down to what I've just explained. Now, this is a, what, what we have today systems, and as they evolve, we want something called quantum supremacy or quantum advantage. Quantum supremacy means something that Google literally invented to win the race against IBM. I don't pay too much attention to that, but quantum advantage means that if you have a problem and if you use a quantum resource, excusing the dog for a second. Apologies for that. I hope it is not too noisy. Um, <clears throat> if you have a problem that you can solve with a quantum system, it should be faster than any amount of classical computing thrown at it. Solving it should be very fast, no matter how much classical computing you throw at it. This is the meaning of quantum advantage. And what it means is that we speak of 
advantage in terms of alg the analysis of algorithms and complexity theory, the O notation. This is where all those theoretical things become really important for us. OK, why is this thing so interesting? Let's look at a problem <clears throat> that is theorized to be one of the first killer applications for quantum computing. Also, do not hesitate to put any question to ask for any clarification. I, I would like also this to be interactive in, at any point. And then after this interest, I'm going to go a bit into why things work in the, in the way they do. So Richard Feynman in, the, in 1980 was one of the first individuals who said, huh, quantum mechanics could be used to do computation. But if you have a system that you want to simulate, for example, you have a chunk of matter that you want to, to know what it does. If you, if you solve exactly, if you try to solve the equations of quantum mechanics for that system, it is computationally intractable. It is incredibly expensive. And Feynman said, well, what happens if we had a, quant a computer that behaved through the laws of quantum mechanics? One. Then <clears throat> one of these problems has to do with things that we like for landscape, that we need to do for landscaping purposes or for agriculture, which is how do we manufacture our um, um, fertilizers? And essentially, in nature, the way fertilization works is by the presence or the contents of nitrogen, and that is mediated by bacteria, by decomposing organisms, by all the kinds of saprophytes and other, by a cycle of life that leads to ammonia at the end of the day. So the problem is, with the amount of people on Earth today and the requirements that we have for feeding everybody, nature cannot literally keep up with the amount of nitrogen that we need to fixate in the soil. So it turns out that somebody figured this out. This is called the Haber-Bosch process. That's how fertilizers are made. But it is incredibly costly. It is incredibly inefficient from the point of view of chemistry. It is a process that has around 14 steps. This is the full, the, the full diagram of what the machinery would look like. The reaction looks relatively simple, but this is called an enthalpy diagram. Basically, this is the amount of energy that must be spent across this pipeline. And if you sum up all these numbers, it becomes incredibly expensive to the point that it is 61% yield, meaning that from the 100% of things you put in, you only get 61% of an output. It is theorized to be responsible from 1% to 2% of the global CO2 emissions. It consumes 5% of the world's natural gas reserves. And it happens at 450 Celsius, roughly the temperature of Venus, at 200 atmospheres, roughly around Venus parameters. So this is incredibly in inefficient in nature. It just happens in the soil. Now the question is, can we harness what nature is doing? To do that, if we opened, what, if, if we took and broke what, wide open what happens in a cell, especially those that manufacture nitrogen in, in plants and bacteria, we would find this protein and these funny looking molecules. And one of them is called the iron molybdenum cofactor. So it, it is this chemical thing. We don't really need to understand here what it does, but basically <clears throat> it takes uh, atoms of nitrogen and sticks them together with, it's like a Lego set. This thing is a Lego constructor that takes nitrogens and attaches a few hydrogens and everything happens beautifully and efficiently at room temperature. And it happens in a way that doesn't go through the inefficiencies. Now, to understand that, we need to solve the quantum chemistry problems. Again, that is extremely expensive, and it has been theorized that if we use a, a classical computer, so the number of orbitals roughly says how many atoms we can introduce. It is a, a function of the number of atoms we, we, we need to compute. And basically, if you use a, quant a classical computing, you pro a classical computer, you probably take one millennium and only solve this bit over here. It takes a, a thousand years to just solve exactly the chemistry of something this small. But if you use a quantum computer, if we could have a quantum computer of the size that we need, instead of a millennium, that would be one year for this kind of molecule. And imagine spending one year would be worth building this for something that takes a substantial amount of the world's GDP and the world's energy. So quantum computing 
if we can realize the promise by figuring out how to build the hardware <clears throat> has transformative potential applications in the future. Another application that <clears throat> is derived in here is logistics, computing exact optimal routes versus computing the approximate optimal routes that we have today. Okay. Any questions so far? <clears throat> Before I go into the more theoretical underpinnings, I promise it's going to be relaxed. Okay. So why, what, is the, what are the principles behind quantum computing? <clears throat> First of all, if we think about what a computer is for, for physicists, especially for people in condensed matter physics, it is simply a chunk of matter that heats up when you send energy patterns, basically streams of bits, and then produces different energy patterns, different streams of bits and bytes. Essentially, this process of dissipation the larger the system, the hotter it, the, the higher the temperature it runs natively, the larger or, or the, the closer it'll behave to the laws of nature that are familiar to us, like heat, um, uh, gravity, uh, classical mechanics, basically. In electrical and computer engineering, we have a, we have a system which is basically a, an electronic realization of a state machine. And then we have analog inputs converted to digital input, to digital outputs, and then digital outputs to analog outputs. So essentially, that's a quite curious view that ends up in computer organization. But if we look at what a computer is from the point of view of what we do daily as computer scientists or computer practitioners, it is simply a way to run algorithms. It is a Turing machine. So what I'm going to do is to try to characterize a quantum computing computing system as a Turing machine, and then try to see what holds and what doesn't. So what are the properties of a classical computing system? <clears throat> forget about hardware, forget about internet, forget about any of the things that are not fundamental to solving problems. So we know that a program must have a finite state. The thing has to fit in memory. It cannot be infinite, otherwise it is non-computable. The program must terminate. A condition of any algorithm is termination. The other one is you have to have an input and you have to have an output. Now, there's a few other things that are not obvious. For example, what we call there's only one state running in a given processor at a given time. Even if we have multi-core systems, every core is running one program thread. Or if, even if we have multi, even multi hardware for multiple threads, each piece of hardware is taking account of one single control for a problem. We also have determinism. Hardware doesn't go random on us. It doesn't throw in results except by, except when it fails. We know if we have a function and the function is a bijection, we know that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, hence we can characterize what the program is, is going to do, roughly speaking. Non-destructive read, we can read the memory contents without destroying the memory contents. Also, we have copyability. <clears throat> we can copy information that is not given in quantum mechanics, and this is very interesting. We also have coherence, meaning that when the computer is on, when it has electricity running through, you can expect from the RAM to the disks to any memory allocated, many memory allocated to remain the same and not degrade. Noise tolerance, the way circuits are constructed is to or they're constructed in a way that avoids noise, or that even if you have disturbances in the, in, in the supply of electricity, the, the computer will keep running up to a certain point. There's irreversibility, which I will talk just a little bit, and there's locality, meaning that if you write in some part of the memory, you don't expect that a random part of the memory in a different place will change. This is what allows us to, for example, build cache memories. So these are Newtonian devices. And one thing that is beautiful is that you can do computing with billiard balls. There's a whole article on how you can reproduce NAND, SNORs, and all the logical gates using, using a billiard ball, ball table. And you can do that in a, in a very low friction setup. So those of you that, that like, would like pool, that's something that you're, to some extent, doing a form of com limited computation. 
So essentially, <clears throat> if you have a regular bit, a classical bit, you only have two states that are separate, one and zero. But if you have a quantum bit, you have something that can morph between zero and one. And even can have, can have can be in any point in the surface. This is called the block sphere. So a quantum bit essentially is a linear combination. This is the sum, the weighted sum of two states, one that represents zero, one that represents one. And because it is a linear combination, when you measure it, you only measure one of the outcomes. It's like having a coin and tossing it and waiting it to see what it what what head what what face it falls on. <clears throat> there are composite finite states. We can join bits together in a classical system to make bytes, for example. We can do something similar with a quantum system. We have collections of these quantum bits, but the mathematics is a bit funky. You get something called tensor calculus, and then this is a strong connection to machine learning. Both quantum computing and machine learning can be restated mathematically using something called tensor networks. And people who already know machine learning are primed to learn the basics, the logic system behind quantum computing really well. So you have an exponential number of classical information within a quantum system. <clears throat> now, the other thing is that you have something called superposition. It is if you have in a classical system zero and one, you may have two distinguishable states that are separate, but in a quantum system, they both live together this point lives at the same time outside and inside of the box. From the point of view of the state mathematically before you measure something, what really happens in nature, whether this is the reality and or we have multiple universes or we have something called the Copenhagen interpretation, we don't know. And this is more for philosophy of science than, than, than physics. But what we know is that the mathematics characterizes very clearly what probability looks like. So we also, given that then we have these systems that behave like zeros and ones, we can apply quantum gates. And there's a notation that even resembles the way we build circuits. And what this, these gates do is they change the states by rotating the vector corresponding to the current outcome and moving it to a different place in the block sphere. That is the first part of quantum computing. If you understand this, then you have at least 30% of quantum computing uh, at least you know what it what it is about. Now, because we have quantum gates, we can do something very nice, which is similar to standard the standard computing practice, which is you can define circuits. Turns out that you can that you have mathematical ways to, to do that very easily. Now, why are these why do these things look so convoluted? Why do these look so complex? Well, it turns out that nature is complicated. And this is an object called the spinner. A spinner is the mathematical representation of what a quantum mechanical system looks like when you operate on it. And there's something called a Clifford algebra. Again, the names don't really matter. What matters here is that there's a way to transform, to make transformations to the system that behaves in a way that, for example, it takes one full turn to go back and to go downwards. And this property is part of what we call a fermionic system. So in essence, we try to build systems that approximate matter rather than light. So they, these systems are also quasi-probabilistic. For example, you can there's a probability of observing zero or one. And if you perform a measurement, there's rules that tell you what the probability will look like. But it is not a probabilistic computer. It is a computer that because of the way we, we can have negative complex probabilities in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of way, so that when you find an algorithm, what the algorithm is going to do is try to use something called interference or the ability of some of some of the results or some of the computational paths to collide with others and make them disappear when they are not solutions. And this is the core of building quantum algorithms. And essentially, let's see, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a few things to open discussion. But essentially, something that is important is that we, if, if we have the way we read a hard disk drive, so this is a micrograph of what a, of what a regular hard disk drive looks like. 
the amount of electricity we send to perform an, a successful read is relatively small. However, when we try and read a quantum system, <coughs> the, the magnitude of the, of the signal sent is roughly comparable to the size of the system, which is governed by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. What this means is that we cannot measure all the properties at once. There's a fundamental limit beyond which we can never resolve what is actually happening. And it is a very strong statistical statement. So, speaking of decoherence, probably, it is simply the property of a quantum system to be initialized in a given state, and across time that state fade fades away, and, and we end up with something that is not easy to interpret. There's another property that is a bit weird, which is uh, one can prove that contrary to a classical system where you have one signal and you can copy that signal, you can copy individual bits, you are not allowed to copy anything in a quantum computer. It is forbidden by the laws of nature. So you have to have creative ways of using <clears throat> your bits so that you have computation that is reversible. Another property is, well, quantum states are sensitive to noise. <clears throat> As I said, when you have a classical bit, it is encoded in voltages in a way that basically you, still, you have a quite big range of things that are zero, things that are interpretable as ones, and things that are in the middle. I see a hand going up. And Prabhu, I think, had a question. Okay, I'll, okay, let me look at that. Right, in a quantum computer, <coughs> copying information is not allowed, because if you could copy information, it means that you would be able to look at what's stored first with arbitrary accuracy, meaning that you would disturb what you have by reading it. And then I'm, go I'm getting there to quantum entanglement. Bear with me for a few more moments. So we also have something interesting. If you have a classical circuit, notice that you have two inputs and one output. However, if you think about it in a more physical manner, there's energy going into these two lines and only one line coming, coming out of it. I mean, it means that some of that energy trans converts into heat. The fact that we have heat is a physical disturbance to the state of a del delicate quantum bit. And the reason we don't want to have irreversible computers is because we don't want to generate heat. So one can do first something called reversible circuits or reversible gates. And there's a proof saying that any circuit that you can build with NANs and NORs, think of NAND memories, you can also build with these two things, Doffel and Fredkin gates. And it has an implication for the future that we may be able to build computers that are much more energy efficient. If you look at a study by Dreschel and Willem, and account for the world's energy production <clears throat> in time. We are poised to build as computer systems that at some point are going to match the energy production. And this is not good. It means that we are really inefficient. We are building computers that consume too much energy at a given moment. However, by using physical principles, we may be able to extend the efficiency of our computing devices. Now, now for entanglement. I think that's one of the core questions. So how does entanglement happen or why does it happen? We don't really know. There's a multitude of theories, but basically let me first say that entanglement is the existence of correlations between what seem to be different physical systems. For example, if you create two, a, a pair of photons, one would spin up, one would spin down, and you separate them apart at different part, different locations in the planet, as most undisturbed as possible, and then you flip the side of one of them the other one would immediately become the opposite side. So how did they communicate instantaneously? That is the question. It, it, the change happens instantaneously. It certainly seems to violate general relativity and other laws. It doesn't for a bunch of reasons, but essentially quantum entanglement is the property of two separate systems to be combined into a larger multi-component system. And this is what is used, for example, for quantum cryptography and something called super dense coding. So for 
a final word, maybe I'm going to skip a few examples. All I will say is that there's already a company called ID Quantic that uses entanglement to sell security solutions to banks in, in Switzerland. And they use the same principles as such. So what, what, what could be a good conclusion based on what we have seen? A quantum computer also has a finite state, a terminating program, inputs and outputs, but it has complex probabilities. There's multiple states simultaneously. You have a superposition of states. If you read something, there's a problem. There's a likelihood that you will destroy what you have just read. You cannot copy information. Memory degrades. You have multiple so sources of environmental noise that makes things harder. You need to have reversible circuits and you have computation that is non-local. That is, you have entanglement. So the biggest challenge right now that some of us are trying to solve is that in a classical system, we only have two resources. We have either space or time. We have CPU time. While in a classic, in a quantum computer, we have, uh, apart from space and time, superposition, coherence, entanglement, and interference. We have this, these four things. We don't really know how to build algorithms systematically with them. And there's a whole, um, a whole host of individuals that are trying to figure out how we can make this systematically to avoid having a PhD in physics. Computation should be about using the systems, not about a research question at some point in time. I think I'm going to stop here and open the floor for questions. Thank you very much for staying with us in, in this conversation. Uh, I see a few questions here. <clears throat> yeah, somebody's asking if uh, you think Moore's law will apply to quantum computers. I think it's time to put on our, uh, what's it called, uh, like future speculation hats, because this is a really fun topic to just like try to figure out what the future really holds for this tech, hey? Briefly, it is hard, it is hard to say in one direction that <clears throat> there are some fundamental ch challenges in the physics. If we have things that are at the atomic level, this, the miniaturization has to happen to a degree that competes with the ability to control the system while not disturbing it. That is the, the, the greatest challenge. On the other hand, we know that Moore's law or something similar to Moore's law must exist if we are going to have if we are going to have systems of the size and ability predicted. So my prediction. 10 years from now, probably, we will see something similar to Moore's law. It will look different in how it will be implemented, but it has to happen. Otherwise, there's no viability for this technology in the long term. I have a question here because you mentioned like how it is today in the 1950s kind of computer and and you know, everybody thinks about like the computer is the size of the room, right, kind of thing. And then I really like how you had that little diagram about how they are doing it. Because obviously we think about what's a computer today, and then immediately you think about like just like the tower motherboard or the laptop, right? And then you're like saying like, well, actually it's this massive refrigerator, right? <laughs> yes, that, right? It's actually a huge refrigerator and it just has a, a huge coolant thing on the other side and it has to go to like close to zero Kelvin, uh, colder than any natural temperature that you find in deep space. Um, it's, I mean, again, this is just for fun and speculation because obviously there we don't really know for certainty. But I, I'll, I'll, you know, just to play the game and get your opinion. And, you know, in the next, let's say, fifty to a hundred years, would this be ever consumer technology, in your opinion, or would this just be, you know, classical computer will still be the main computing that we will use in consumer technology? And this would be like, you know, just how today we have farms of GPUs, but nobody in their house has farms of GPUs, right? It's all just a few big tech or big states that have this type of computing power. They, you know, when I say they will be like, you know, the US, France, let's say Canada, uh, China, Germany, etc. They will have a quantum computer. And any sort of benefits that we get out of quantum computer will be because of 
you know, one small installation or think tank that has access to this massive, you know, technology, and then it trickles down. Like, like to your point, right? The fertilizer problem, right? Is that the scenario that we're seeing? Is very unlikely. I mean, I say that here, obviously, from a twenty thousand foot uh, distance, but it seems unlikely that this will become consumer tech when classical computing is so good already at consumer tech, right? Uh -huh. Let Let me partition that into, let's say, four stages. I know, I, I, I asked you a very long question. OK, so le let me put my speculation cap on, and I will suspend this belief into, in the problems that we seem to face right now, but I'll try to be careful. So I see a very immediate window of work within the next five years to get to the first examples of all tolerant compute quantum systems. They are not going to have many qubits, logical qubits. We are not going to run this high promise algorithms that are going to break cryptography or something or, or solve this problem of, of quantum simulation, but they will allow us to develop better quantum algorithms by removing the more hardware related errors from our thinking. The next 10 years probably will see the first commercially viable, 10 to 15 years commercially viable quantum system that can be accessed through the cloud, like we can do that with the, with the IBM systems, but that will have enough resources to show strong proof of principle for this challenging, uh, the, the, these kinds of challenging instances that we are after. I do foresee in the next 20 to 30 years <clears throat> that the, the, all the ways we build quantum systems today are going to be very different from the quantum computing systems later. Why? Because all what we have are experimental technologies and nobody has the final answer on how to build the systems. However, the evidence that we have right now points up to the fact that we are learning how to control many aspects of the system and that there will be an integration of technologies. And finally, a long-term element in which, yes, it, it, I, it, it's hard. Ford uh, at some point said, or I think it was IBM or someone who said, uh, in the 1950s that there was no there was room in the world only for five computers i don't want to make the same mistake but it is hard to foresee how this would be consumer -driven. yeah but but it seems like we're dealing now with the limits of what you can achieve as in the in the physical realm right that's where like it doesn't quite apply to you know, I, I I know that quote, right? When the IBM people said like there would only be a need for like six of these machines in the whole world, right? And now we everybody has one in their pocket, right? But we're already at, almost at the limit of what you can do in terms of like how many uh, transistors you can add into like a single die of a chip, right? Because of heat and and how they interfere with each other and everything. And these challenges they look even more complicated right so maybe that's that's where i see like how, how would this get miniaturized and put into like consumer tech right right it, the, the, there's a part of that which is quantum sensors which are much more readily integratable for example if i do foresee having quantum sensors on wearable electronics that's not a problem but in the case of quantum computing is tricky because at the end of the day you have material sciences advances that point to the ability to miniaturize but as you say there's the, we, we seem to be dealing with the fundamental laws of nature. Now, we also know that quantum mechanics, is, the, the basic quantum mechanics is simply a specific case of something called quantum electrodynamics. So if we are able to use more sophisticated theories or to find more sophisticated theories that, is, that explain why quantum mechanics works the way it does, we might be able to, to make some headway. But this, this is for probably 30 to 50 years later. All right, that's, that's that's really cool stuff. I really like all this stuff, and and I liked your uh, the fertilizer example as well because I didn't know the um, how much energy it takes to create fertilizer, and I really like how also it's like, but then you think about it, how it happens in nature, and it's like, oh, it just happens. We don't have to push, you know, the temperature of Venus into the Earth to make sort the Earth to just make fertilizer in itself, right? Uh, anyway, it's just interesting because technology, right? It's like everything that we've been able to accomplish um, by finding all these artificial processes, right? Like just the process of creating fertilizer through technology. And um, yeah, and like you said, like the yield, imagine if you could spend one year in a computing problem, but then it will have uh, huge ramifications for the rest of the planet, right? That's pretty cool. All right, everybody, we're 
almost at the top of the hour. Uh, final questions for Santiago we could, before we stop the recording and, and call it for today. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions. Um, right, it doesn't look like we do. Oh, well, we have one more coming out. Ah. <clears throat> oh, that. Hmm. So the problem with anti-gravity is that from the point of view of something called quantum chromodynamics, which is the study of how subatomic particles combine together, we have not been able to deduce that you can produce a force to counteract gravity. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying is that with the physics that we know of, to the best of my understanding, it doesn't seem to be very promising. For zero energy machines, it also seems unlikely because it means going against the principles of thermodynamics, which oddly enough, and this is very cool, they do apply in quantum physics. You have quantum thermodynamics and extracting energy from something that is already in a state of transient disorder seems very unlikely. But again, and uh, this is the best of my knowledge. Other, other people who are much more knowledgeable of the, of the fundamental physics may give you a different answer. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Santiago. On behalf of everybody on the group and everybody here today, this is again very, very interesting stuff. I'm um, uh, once, uh, you know, maybe if if you run into any big milestones or any cool new tooling, anything that you want to share later on with the group, you know, just feel free to reach out and we can do another uh, a number two session because I think this is a really cool topic and I think. Uh, it's very different as well. We don't always get to speak about this kind of stuff here on the on the online groups as well. So appreciate your time. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And until next time, stay safe, take care. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you all.